different department. I hope you all are enjoying the sunshine um, and enjoying the rest of enjoying your week. Um, today, I want to start again with announcements and our diversity share. So open it up to the floor. Anyone can either put it in the chat or unmute and share any announcements they have, events, good news they would like to share, shout outs. Um, anyone have any announcements? Okay, well, we are going to, the one announcement I have is that we are going to have happy hour after seminar gathering today. We're going to actually try a new location. Big thanks to Nora, Nate, and Lindsay, really, for working on finding us a new location. So we are going to walk over to Grain together here right after our seminar, which is on Main Street down on the corner of Tyre Avenue. So let me know if you have any questions about that, and we'll walk over here after, after seminar. Does anyone have any diversity shares? Just pop something in the chat box. Oh, great. Thanks, Pinky. So a link to an article at the AGU. Um, exclusionary behaviors reinforce historical biases and contribute to loss of talent in earth sciences. So check that out. I also had an article I wanted to share um, from Earth's Futures AGU's open access strategies and barriers strategies for and barriers to collaboratively developing anti-racist policies and resources as described by geoscientists of color. Um, so I'd recommend looking at that if you're interested in department development of anti-racist policies and I'll put that link here in the chat as well. With that I am going to pass it over to Katie who is going to introduce our speaker today. Okay so I am going to be introducing our seminar speaker today um, Dr. Oliver Fraunfeld. Um, he received his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate from University of Virginia in environmental sciences, focusing on atmospheric circulation. And then um, he went on to work at the National Snow and Ice Center and is now an associate professor in geography at Texas A&M. Um, he has won the uh, John Russell Mather Paper of the Year Award several times, and in 2020, he received the Association of Former Students Distinguished Achievement Award for Teaching. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Fraunfeld. Thanks for that introduction, Catherine, or Katie, as people seem to call you there. Um, <clears throat> as Katie mentioned, I, I got my start sort of on my academic my start to my academic career at the at the University of Colorado at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. So that explains why there's a guy in Texas working on permafrost, which might not make too much sense otherwise. Uh, but I did do something different for my graduate research and then for my for that first job I started working on different aspects of the cryosphere and specifically on permafrost and so what I'll be presenting today is some some work that has evolved over time obviously so we we went from initially uh, at the National Snow and Ice Data Center rescuing data and then establishing when and where and how uh, frozen ground and specifically permafrost is changing in response to climate change. But then this work has evolved since then to look at also the feedbacks from those changes or the the interactions and the surface atmosphere coupling that might arise in areas where we're changing uh, the surface from being permanently frozen or from being frozen uh, to suddenly being unfrozen and interacting more actively with the overlying atmosphere. And so that's some of the work that I'll be talking about today with the role of permafrost in Eurasian land atmosphere interaction. And so most of the work, or actually all of the work I've done uh, pretty much has been in Eurasia, uh, has, uh, has been done based on uh, soil temperature observations from the, from the former Soviet Union uh, that we've been working with at the National Snow Data Center, uh, but also some work in, in China and on the Tibetan Plateau. But today I'll be focusing primarily on what's happening in uh, the former Soviet Union. And let's see the controls, there we go. So just to get everybody uh, sort of on the same page, people are probably familiar with the cryosphere. And when you think about the cryosphere, you might think about see the sea ice cover or about snow cover or glaciers or something, uh, but frozen ground is maybe a cryospheric variable that people are less familiar with. Uh, and so when we're talking about frozen ground, we're including per permafrost, but also seasonally frozen areas. <clears throat> and so when we add up, the, the, the area extent of frozen ground. Uh, actually, you can see here 57% of the Northern Hemisphere land areas are, are underlain by frozen ground or are made up of, uh, of soil that's frozen at least at some portion during the year. 
which makes frozen ground the largest cryospheric variables and variable in terms of area extent. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left hand side here, places where we have actual permafrost shown in the in the purple shading. And then as we move uh, into the lower latitudes, we only have seasonally frozen ground, which as that term implies, are areas where we only have uh, soil freezing that occurs uh, every cold season, and then it, it thaws out again during the warm season. And then we also have areas that are only intermittently, intermittently frozen, uh, meaning maybe a few weeks or, or a few days every year. But you can also see superimposed on here the snow line. And so if I'd asked you know, what people think might be the largest cryospheric variable, you might have said snow cover, uh, because it is you know, pretty large, obviously. But you can see here in terms of the snow line that the area of frozen ground in certain parts of the world does extend farther south. It does extend beyond that maximum area of snow, which makes sense because when you think about snow cover, you know, for the snow to be able to stick on the ground, the ground has to be frozen. And so therefore, frozen ground has to be uh, at least as large as the, as the maximum extent of the snow cover. Uh, but it, and it's even a little bit larger than that in, in some areas. So then when we are talking about permafrost, we're considering any soil material areas where there's any soil or ground material that remains at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more consecutive years. <clears throat> Which by that definition also brings me to one of permafrost scientists probably biggest uh, pet peeves, which is when people when talk about when people talk about permafrost melting. Uh, which, uh, of course, that's impossible because permafrost is soil and soil can't melt. Uh, so it can only thaw any moisture, any soil moisture, any moisture in general that might be within that soil or might be in that uh, in that permafrost. The moisture will melt, uh, but the permafrost itself only thaws because it just simply changes temperature uh, from being frozen to being uh, to no longer being frozen. And in fact, permafrost doesn't even have to contain any moisture at all. And so then there wouldn't be any melting associated with that thawing process. Uh, permafrost, as I'll also show a little bit more in, in a minute, it's a major component of high latitude environments. So places that are uh, cold enough to where you have a permanent, permanently frozen soil or soil that's frozen two or more years. Uh, that is that is sort of a, a unique characteristic in those areas because any any plants uh, can only grow within the top layer of that permafrost that happens to thaw every warm season. Uh, any kind of uh, soil microbial activity, any kind of hydrologic processes within the soil uh, is restricted because of that, because of the permafrost. And so it does end up being a really impactful variable or property in cold regions. Permafrost or frozen soil in general then is impacted by a number of different factors, most obviously by air temperature. And so as air temperatures are increasing, uh, that means that the soil temperatures might also increase from that, and so that can that that can end, end up impacting permafrost. Snow cover is also a really important variable because snow insulates the ground, and that then plays a large role in the, the thermal properties of the soil. And so, the air temperature and snow cover combined are probably the, the two biggest variable in terms of influencing the distribution of, of frozen soil. But there's also lots of other factors like vegetation, and depending on time of the year these other factors can have different feedbacks or can have different interactions with the soil. Uh, vegetation can shade the soil uh, and can therefore protect permafrost. Uh, same with organic matter, uh, but it depends on what kind of organic matter it is. If you have a, a nice thick peat layer sitting on top of your soil, that will also insulate the permafrost. And then any, any kind of soil properties like soil moist, like the soil density, soil texture, hydrologic movement, whether that's water on top of the soil or water within the soil, and any anthropogenic disturbances will impact permafrost. And so not just you know, the general climate change or global warming impacting uh, the soil temperatures and therefore permafrost, but also disturbances in terms of maybe wildfire activity, as you have fires burning, forests burning, the vegetation cover or that organic layer on top of the soil that will again remove the insulation and that will then expose that permafrost to the atmosphere. And any kind of uh, infrastructure that's built in, in Arctic regions on top of permafrost is also a disturbance and these, you know, there have to be um, certain engineering uh, precautions to, to building things like roads and pipelines and buildings and uh, utilities on, on in permafrost areas. Permafrost uh, is of course changing due to climate change and so here we're seeing a figure from Cerez and Barry 
that illustrates this concept of Arctic amplification, where Arctic areas have been warming much more quickly and to much higher temperatures than any other part of the world. And so we see here four maps corresponding uh, to winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And so it's the anomaly, it's a, a 10 year average with respect to a long term mean showing where warming has occurred for, during the different seasons. And you can see that the dark orange and red shading is uh, primarily concentrated in, in the high latitude areas. And so the darkest red shading is over the Arctic oceans. And this is what's what the main cause is of Arctic amplification. Uh, it's feedbacks from the decreasing sea ice cover as you remove that highly reflective ice cover from the Arctic Ocean and expose the darker ocean. That ocean then ends up absorbing more energy. The ocean temperatures are higher. That delays the refreezing of the sea ice, causes earlier melting of the sea ice the following warm season. And so it triggers this positive feedback uh, that then accelerates the, the Arctic amplification and, and largely causes the Arctic amplification. And if you look at the little insets in each panel that shows you were averaged across all latitudes, uh, the highest amount of warming is occurring. And so the, the right-hand side, it'll inset right here, it corresponds to the, the northern polar regions. And so you can see that in winter, the most warming occurs in the Arctic. In spring, the most warming occurs in the Arctic. Summer, most warming occurs in the Arctic. There's also a bit of warming in, in the Antarctic, primarily the Antarctic Peninsula over here. And then the autumn picture again looks much like winter. And so not only do we see a lot of warming in high latitudes, which will impact permafrost and the distribution of frozen ground, uh, but there's also this question as to how changes to frozen ground might then be contributing to the Arctic amplification. So you can see a lot of the land areas are also showing up as, as warming, as showing up as orange in these maps. And so then the question is, how much of that is sort of spillover of heat from the ocean areas uh, versus how much of that is actually uh, the, the changes that are occurring to the, the landscape, to the, the permafrost distribution that might then be comprising a, a, a the terrestrial analog to Arctic amplification. And that's certainly something that we're looking at uh, with our work. Uh, getting back quickly to permafrost and the distribution of permafrost, uh, this, this map here now shows uh, the, the same sort of distribution that we saw before with permafrost, but it also shows the different kinds of permafrost. Uh, and so the darkest purple shaded areas correspond to areas that are continuous, considered to be continuous permafrost. And so you can see down here and with the legend that continues, continuous permafrost are areas where 90 to 100 percent of the area is underlain by permafrost. So there really is uh, a, an impermeable barrier beneath the soil. <clears throat> that then ends up, or that, well, that impermeable barrier that might reach all the way to the surface in the winter season uh, that, that's made up of, of permanently frozen soil. And then as we move lower in latitude, uh, we see that things change from being a continuous permafrost to only being discontinuous permafrost, showing the lighter purple shading. Those are areas where only 50 to 90% 90, 90 of the area are un underlain by permafrost. And then it decreases to sporadic and isolated permafrost where that permafrost then gets patchier and patchier and shallower and shallower. And so uh, again, one of the, the premises of, of my work is that uh, we, will, we expect to see different feedbacks or different land atmosphere interactions, depending on what kind of permafrost zone you're in, whether in an area that's uh, where the entire area is underlain by permafrost versus only areas where there are patches of permafrost. So then in terms of the, the feedbacks, uh, when you hear about climate feedbacks from permafrost, uh, what you probably think of is what's shown on this, on this map right here, on this, on this figure right here, which are the carbon feedbacks from permafrost. And so as the greenhouse gas loading of the atmosphere is increasing due to global warming, and those additional, those you know, fossil fuels release greenhouse gases, which cause warming, which then cause degradation of permafrost, that permafrost contains a lot of carbon. And as the permafrost thaws, uh, microbial activity mobilizes the carbon, releases it to the atmosphere. So suddenly you're adding more greenhouse gases in the form of methane, carbon dioxide, uh, and other forms of carbon to the atmosphere. So the initial greenhouse gases cause warming that releases more greenhouse gases, and that triggers another one of those positive feedback effects related to permafrost. So a lot of people are looking at these carbon impacts or these, these carbon feedbacks, 
which is why I'm not. And so what we want to do is you know, look at something that's a little bit different. So rather than looking at these uh, geochemical feedbacks from permafrost degradation, what we're looking at with our work is looking at the geophysical feedbacks from those changes. And so the overarching question to my research then is how the surface atmosphere interactions in high latitude land areas will change in response to permafrost degradation. So as we're changing that distribution of permafrost going from areas continually or more the entire areas underlain by permafrost to discontinuous permafrost to only patches of permafrost, uh, what does that then mean for uh, the land atmosphere interactions or those, those geophysical feedbacks? To illustrate that a little bit more and give show a little bit more uh, sort of what we mean by permafrost and uh, with uh, this landscape degradation, uh, I'm going to show in a second here a transect that goes across Alaska. So basically going across a high latitude land area, starting from a low latitude area, like in this case, uh, Chickaloon, which is a native settlement in southern Alaska, uh, up to Fairbanks, and then up to Prudhoe Bay. And if we look at a, a vertical profile or a transect that's, that goes up Canada, this is sort of what the soil profile looks like. And so again, we've got Chickaloon here on the right-hand side, lower the lower latitudes of Alaska, Fairbanks, higher latitudes. We're going from 62 north, 65 north, all the way up to Prudhoe Bay, 70 degrees north. And you can see how the permafrost distribution changes. So the farther north we are, the higher in latitude we are, the more we experience continuous permafrost. And so you can see here this, this huge area where literally the entire area is underlain by continuous permafrost. And then as you move lower and lower in latitude and we get into the discontinuous permafrost area and then maybe sporadic and isolated, you see that we only have these, these smaller patches, these, these small islands of permafrost. You also see that that top layer of soil that I mentioned briefly before, the active layer, uh, gets deeper and deeper the lower we get in latitude. And so the active layer, that's an important variable when it comes to permafrost. Uh, it's one of the ways that we gauge how permafrost is changing via deepening of this active layer. And the active layer, by definition, is the, the layer of soil that thaws every summer, every, every warm season. And then the, the annual active layer depth is the maximum depth of the thaw propagation, the maximum depth of that active layer which then, as climate is changing, is getting deeper and deeper with time. And generally speaking, the active layer is deeper in lower latitudes. So it can be up to you know, three or more meters deep uh, in the southern portions of Alaska versus in the northern portions where we have continuous permafrost and it's much, much colder. The active layer is maybe only a half a meter or maybe only 20, 30 centimeters. You can also maybe visualize in a picture like this that if you have surface degradation or active layer degradation that occurs or permafrost degradation that occurs by a deepening of the active layer, that any moisture like snow cover, for example, that sits on top of the soil, as that snow melts, the moisture can't really drain away in the continuous permafrost area. So in continuous permafrost, you do have this impermeable barrier in the soil, so just beneath the active layer, uh, re represented by the permafrost. So all that moisture then ends up saturating the active layer any moisture that's contained within the, the soil itself uh, will melt, the snow will melt, and all that moisture will be trapped in the active layer. And that creates this really uh, swampy wetland environment in many parts of the Arctic, uh, which if you've been there before, you know that there's, in, in the summertime, you know, mosquitoes are terrible up in Alaska, um, just because, or in, in, in the heart and highlights in general, not just in Alaska, also in Russia, because you have all these wetlands everywhere, and that's a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Uh, Arctic is also characterized by tens of thousands of lakes, uh, because there is this impermeable barrier within the soil that prevents drainage. And then as we move into the discontinuous permafrost area, the active layer gets deeper. Any kind of snow melt that occurs or moisture that melts out of the soil itself uh, will be distributed over much thicker active layer depth, but it can also penetrate deeper into the soil. It can sort of drain between those islands and pockets of permafrost. And so as we degrade permafrost in discontinuous, sporadic and isolated areas, we might see a drying out of the landscape that's occurring, whereas in permafrost areas, as we change things there, as we warm things up there, that moisture can't drain away and we're gonna change the landscape into a much uh, swampier, a much wetter environment. And that then is sort of the, the crux of these geophysical feedbacks that we're looking at. Uh, as climate is changing, 
how will these changing surface characteristics, uh, whether you end up having wetlands like on the left-hand side here, or really dry areas, how does that impact surface atmosphere interactions? So then the, the research question for this first portion of the, uh, the, the work that I'm showing here is how uh, can frozen ground degradation alter the surface moisture fluxes uh, and therefore impact the Arctic hydrologic cycle? So if we have areas where we're changing the, the landscape to wetlands and we end up having a lot of evaporation, we might expect to have more cloud cover, more rainfall, whereas in the dry areas, as we degrade the permafrost, that moisture disappears, we end up having a much, much drier landscape and therefore maybe a drier atmosphere, uh, which will then produce you know, different atmospheric conditions, different forms of atmospheric circulation, maybe even. So the two proposed scenarios that we're testing are one, that we have a continuous, that over a continuous permafrost environment, we're gonna have that saturated active layer. We're gonna have those wetland conditions, especially during the warm season, because we have that impermeable barrier in the soil. And so we're going to see increased evapotranspiration. Uh, in the summertime, it gets relatively warm in the Arctic or surprisingly warm in the Arctic. So we do end up having convection, or we might even have a convective precipitation and clouds forming there in continuous permafrost areas. But then over discontinuous permafrost, we're hypothesizing that we end up with drier soil conditions because that moisture can drain away and percolate down into the ground more easily. So we have less evapotranspiration uh, and maybe decreased humidity and decreased cloud cover and precipitation. So to investigate this uh, initially, we picked the domain uh, that you know, encompasses the high latitudes of Eurasia, Eurasia, so north of 50. I'll show a map here in a second from 15 east to 165 west. Uh, and for this first portion, we're looking at a reanalysis product. So we're looking at the NASA reanalysis, the, the mirror product. Uh, the reason we're looking at the mirror product is because it has this mirror land um, sub product or a sort of um, improved version where uh, reanalyses are obviously, uh, as, you, as you might know, problematic because they ingest a lot of uh, the, the data that they ingest over time changes and the quality of that data changes and that introduces discontinuities. And so it's always a little bit tricky to do any kind of climate uh, and especially trend analyses using a reanalysis product. But mirror land has been nudged back to reality uh, by using the GPCP, the, the Global Precipitation Climatology uh, product. And so especially as it comes to the, the precipitation data and the, the analogous variables, the mirror product, the mirror land product uh, is supposed to be a little bit better. And so that's what we used. Uh, you can see the resolution, the study period was 1979 to 2012. And we extracted latent heat, sensible heat and precipitation from mirror land. And what we did was we calculated this variable called evaporative fraction, which is the ratio of latent heating to total energy. So how much of the energy at the surface is being expended for evaporation and for latent heating? Uh, so it's, it's kind of the inverse of the Bowen ratio in that sense. And so evaporative fraction then tells us, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a way to, to gauge how much uh, how much evapotranspiration we might have and how much humidity and, and, and evaporation we have into the atmosphere. So we, we then analyze trends in that evaporative fraction uh, using uh, non-parametric statistics uh, because you know, uh, using linear regression wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, and what we wanna do is we wanna figure out whether we can relate evaporative fraction uh, in terms of these land owing from those land atmosphere interactions to precipitation. And so what we do is we connect the morning evaporative fraction to afternoon, to the probability of afternoon precipitation using logistic regression. Uh, and then we also see if those interactions and if that probability of, of actually having rainfall occurring due to evaporative fraction, if that varies over different permafrost classes. So with this, we're trying to establish uh, whether there are differing land atmosphere interactions as we're gauging with evaporative fraction, and if that then can lead to different, uh, different amounts of or to different rainfall patterns. So basically the changes in the hydrologic cycle. To categorize the permafrost environment or the, what happens within the soil and to account for that different permafrost distribution in terms of continuous, discontinuous, sporadic and isolated, we use a permafrost product called the Permafrost Zonation Index that was produced by Stefan Gruber about 10 years ago. 
and it gives a nice gridded product that tells us uh, for sort of every land area, for every pixel of land area, uh, what the, the permafrost distribution there is. And so that then allows us to take uh, our reanalysis product, our other data, and categorize each pixel as either being continuous permafrost, discontinuous, sporadic, or, or isolated. If we're trying to establish whether changes to permafrost might ultimately influence the hydrologic cycle and precipitation patterns, we want to double check first to see if precipitation is even changing. Uh, and so to, to do that, we first looked at uh, what how precipitation looks uh, during the latter half of the record versus the earlier part of the record to see where precipitation is changing. And so we do see, if you recall, what the permafrost distribution looks like. So right here, uh, we're seeing the continuous permafrost area sh shown in the dark blue shading. And so basically the, the northern and northeastern portions of Siberia. And we do actually see that there has been an increase in precipitation in those areas. So the blue shading here corresponds to those precipitation increases. And then the lower latitude areas, the discontinuous uh, sporadic and isolated and seasonally frozen areas, those are actually areas where we're seeing decreases in precipitation. And so the question is, you know, how much of that is related to potentially the distribution of permafrost in those places? So we calculated our evapodiffraction and we plotted up the, 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 the trends. And so we created anomalies and then look at the anomalies in those trends. Uh, so here we're showing, I'm showing the mid-season months of that evaporative fraction uh, variable. And so we're seeing that in January, there's not too much that's happening in terms of positive trends of evaporative fraction. In April, we're starting to see some, some positive trends occurring uh, in the higher latitudes. And then we're seeing decreases occurring in the lower latitudes. As I'll show in a minute though, with that evaporative fraction calculation, that's highly biased to having low values. So if you're dividing that, you know, that ratio of latent heating, the sensible the latent heating by a, by a low number, like as we might expect in the summer in, in the winter time, that there's not a lot of energy in general, that that variable then sort of blows up. It's sort of like calculating the relative error, giving you, giving you a falsely inflated numbers. And so some of what we're seeing in, in the months of uh, January and April and also October, some of those, those higher values are actually artifacts of that calculation. Uh, but the only place when we're really seeing something more interesting happening happens to be the, the summer month of July. And so there in the same areas where we're seeing some of the precipitation changes, we are also seeing changes occurring in evaporative fraction. So we're seeing these increases in evaporative fraction occurring over the uh, the central Siberian plateau and some of the eastern portions of Siberia. And then we're seeing decreases in evaporative fraction in the places where we're seeing decreases in precipitation as well. So if we zoom in on that July map, that's sort of what I just showed here, uh, we, the, the most interesting area sort of is this bullseye region here that happens over the central Siberian plateau, because that is, is also an area where we saw some, uh, some increases that occur in uh, in rainfall or in precipitation over the long term. If we double check that, because the evaporative fraction is made up of latent, heated, latent heating divided by total energy, we see that the same area is also characterized by increases in latent heating and some of the areas we're seeing decrease in evaporative fraction down here are, in, are characterized by areas of decreasing uh, latent heating and so, uh, so a lot of these blue areas do correspond to the same places where we do see increases in evaporative fraction. Uh, we also have to make sure that, uh, that we're accounting for what's happening in sensible heating. And so we're again seeing in that central Siberian plateau area, not only do we have increases occurring in latent heating, as we would expect, but we also have decreases occurring in sensible heating. And so in terms of that evaporative fraction variable, we definitely see that there's something sort of interesting happening uh, in, this, in this permafrost area in the central Siberian plateau. And so if we take those evaporative fraction trends for all the pixels or for, for all the grid cells, uh, where we're seeing significant changes. And I should point out that when we're showing these trends, uh, all the mass dot areas where, not, where you're not seeing anything, those are places where the changes are not statistically significant. And so we're only showing this, the statistically significant trends here. Same thing with these box plots. And so interestingly enough, if you look at these box plots, we're seeing that we see that the increase in evaporative fraction, the statistically significant increases are occurring in the continuous permafrost zone. 
In the discontinuous permafrost zone, we are also seeing a little bit of increases, but the discontinuous permafrost zone sort of straddles uh, the, the positive and negative values. So discontinuous permafrost might be a little bit of a transitional area. And then definitely in the sporadic and isolated permafrost areas, we're seeing decreases in evaporative fraction. And so this is sort of the a first, you know, interesting clue that you know what's happening in continue over continuous permafrost, or that there is something different maybe that's happening over continuous permafrost uh, relative to these other areas. And we did also uh, test and uh, the, what's happening in continuous permafrost is statistically significantly different from the, the discontinuous, the sporadic, and the isolated areas. So that those, those changes over continuous permafrost are sort of unique. The trends then in July precipitation, so if are, are, are shown here again, so before I showed the map of the overall precipitation trends, here now are the same precipitation trends that we're seeing concurrently with the evaporative fraction trends. And so again, we're seeing an increase in precipitation occurring in that same area where we're seeing increased evaporative fraction, increased atmospheric, uh, uh, humidity sort of or increased latent heating from the surface. If we now do our logistic regression to say, well, how much of this precipitation increase is really happening due to evaporative fraction, we do a logistic regression. That logistic regression uh, tells us uh, the probability of seeing afternoon rainfall based on morning evaporative fraction anomalies. And so basically what we're seeing here in this map is that uh, in all the areas where we, th th there's a positive relationship. So basically morning evaporative fraction does lead to an increased likelihood of afternoon precipitation. And so if we then uh, scale our trends in evaporative fraction by this, by this increase in precipitation probability, that tells us where uh, we are seeing precipitation in response to evaporative fraction changes, and also what the magnitude of that evaporation, that evaporative fraction trend is. And so, basically, what we're again seeing is this little area over the central Siberian plateau, where we can attribute the increases in afternoon precipitation to the changes that are occurring in evaporative fraction. And so, the probabilities here—they're not earth-shatteringly huge. They're on the order of maybe a half to one percent increased probability, but again, we're looking at a you know thirty to thirty-five year time span, and so over over the long term, you know, we're seeing about a, a percent change every year, and so over thirty-five years, we're then seeing about a thirty-five percent increase in precipitation occurring in this due to evaporative fraction in this continuous permafrost area. And so then we can also look at uh, there's the same box plot that we looked at before but in terms of the precipitation probability change. And again, we're seeing the, the highest probability of precipitation occurring due to evaporative fraction in continuous permafrost. And then we're seeing these statistically significant differences in continuous permafrost relative to what's happening in, in, continu in discontinuous, sporadic, and isolated. And so again, this sort of leads us to, to uh, think that there's some support to this notion that you know, changing land atmosphere interactions, at least as gauged by evaporative fraction, uh, that that this that this is attributable to uh, the what's happening at the surface with permafrost. So then, summing up uh, this these sur surface much moisture flux changes, we're seeing evaporative fraction increases uh, that are occurring over continuous permafrost uh, and in the warm seasons, so primarily in the month of July. Uh, and these areas of, evap of evaporative fraction increase coincide with areas where we're seeing precipitation increasing. And then the logistic regression does tell us that increasing morning evaporative fraction, so if you have a lot of evaporation occurring in the morning, that then can lead to an increased probability of afternoon rainfall in those same areas, which supports the notion that places where we do have saturated surface conditions, like in continuous permafrost, uh, can lead to maybe changes in the hydrologic cycle. So if we're seeing continuous permafrost slowly degrading, initially we'll see a, a wetting that occurs, we'll see a saturated active layer, we'll see these wetland conditions in the summertime. And so initially the Arctic hydrologic cycle might change to where we have uh, an enhanced hydrologic cycle, which is what most uh, climate model simulations are also telling us is that due to climate change, we're going to see an enhanced Arctic hydrologic cycle. But this also suggests that as we transition from continuous permafrost to discontinuous permafrost, uh, once we hit, once we get to discontinuous permafrost, things might actually dry out in the Arctic. 
So we might see an initial increasing as the models suggest with the hydrologic cycle, but then subsequent to that, the Arctic region could end up drying out and maybe the, the polar deserts that we see in parts of the Arctic might be expanding. So if the, the, the big question is, you know, so far we've looked at a statistical association between the surface and the atmosphere. It's always difficult to establish cause and effect and to really figure out, you know, how and why these things are happening. Uh, and so this, this first part of the, the presentation is more of a, a proof of concept. You know, is there something to our idea, to our hypothesis that we might expect different land atmosphere interactions for this next portion now? Uh, we'll start to look at more specifically what those mechanisms could be. And so we want to quantify the effects of Arctic permafrost degradation on the surface energy budget, also the, the planetary boundary layer and atmospheric circulation. So then can these changes that are occurring at the land surface that we're seeing that could maybe impact precipitation, can they have more far reaching impacts in terms of affecting the energy budget and, and the, the, the boundary layer uh, in general and also atmospheric circulation variability. And so for that, we did a, uh, a WARF study. Uh, so using the WARF research and forecasting model, uh, which is a sort of a, a regional climate model, at least the way we were apply, applying it. And we did a sensitivity analysis where we modeled the land atmosphere processes of land atmosphere interactions over continuous permafrost and also over discontinuous permafrost to see uh, if we see different land atmosphere interactions in those two kinds of environments. And so we used historical data as the initial and boundary conditions for those simulations, but we used an idealized and prescribed land surface. So as I'll show in a minute, we have two scenarios, one that's continuous permafrost and one that's discontinuous permafrost, and that's what we're prescribing in the model, but the atmosphere and the, the, the input uh, that's happening uh, or, or that, we're, that we're using is based on, on reality on historical observations. And so then we're going to say, how are these historical observations different over continuous permafrost versus discontinuous? And so if you're familiar with, uh, with WARF modeling, we're doing a nested approach. So we're going down from a larger domain to a smaller domain. Uh, and so this, that necessitates this nested approach so we can sort of scale things down uh, to get to the local higher resolution simulations. Uh, we also use the sort of traditional uh, subgrid scale parameterizations based on other studies that people have used uh, in Arctic in Arctic research and Arctic studies. Uh, and we're doing two 72 hour runs. So this is not a climate simulation. We're not looking at, you know, 10, 20 or 30 years. We're looking at two 72 hour runs and comparing how those how those weather conditions are different over continuous versus discontinuous permafrost. And the, the first 12 hours are considered model spin up. Our domain is that same area that we had for the first part of the study. So we're looking over at central Siberian plateau, or that's what we ultimately want to zoom in on. And to be able to do that, we have to start with a larger domain. And so we have this, this nested approach where, our, where our, our, our coarser grid, our coarser scale domain is domain one right here. Um, and the input, so, so we first run WARF on that one domain, then we use the output from that on the next smaller domain on domain two, and then, so, and then sequentially step it down to get to that local scale. That's where we get on a 0.3 kilometer horizontal resolution and where we then don't have to use any sub, uh, sub grid scale parameterizations. Uh, and so uh, for the subsequent results that I'm gonna show, we will focus on domain two and domain four. And so when I show the results for our synoptic scale, our synoptic scale results, that's going to be this larger uh, domain two right here. And then the local domain will be this tiny little white box right there. And so for WARF initially, uh, we're using subgrid scale parameterizations, cloud, uh, cloud parameterizations, which we can turn off after we get to domain two because below three kilometers, uh, WARF can resolve clouds and cloud processes. And then once we get down to domain four, we also turn off the, the planetary boundary layer parameterizations uh, and let them evolve naturally. And so then this is the one where we can really start to analyze the, the actual uh, surface fluxes and boundary layer processes. We have four different simulations that we do. And so and complicating this a little bit is that if we're going to analyze land atmosphere interactions, we probably expect those to be different uh, when we have what we consider active syn synoptic forcing. And so if we have maybe some inactive weather pattern occurring, if we have a, a frontal system or a low pressure system tracking across an area, uh, the land atmosphere interactions will probably be different than if we have 
no major weather events occurring. If we have what we consider a quiescent uh, synoptic forcing, like a high pressure system where there's really nothing that's happening in terms of frontal passages or, or precipitation or low pressure systems or anything like that. And so we test both of those scenarios and we do that for continuous and discontinuous permafrost. So those are our four scenarios. Uh, we look how an active weather scenario differs on continuous versus discontinuous permafrost and how a quiescent weather scenario varies over continuous versus discontinuous permafrost. For our idealized soil and surface conditions, I said that we prescribed that uh, initially. And so we, we for our continuous permafrost, uh, these soil conditions are based on observations. And so uh, we, we got soil temperature observations from locations uh, within our domain and sort of figured out what's the, what's the average soil temperature profile, what's the average soil moisture profile. Uh, and then we specified that, or we used those values for the WARF model, or, or rather for the, the NOAA land surface model that's part of WARF, uh, which has four soil layers, as you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, and so for the, the main difference is that for the continuous permafrost simulation, uh, we assumed that the soil moisture is maximum. And so the, this, this 0.439 uh, cubic meters per cubic meter of moisture corresponds a saturated condition. So we're simulated an active layer uh, so we, we've got an active layer here with temperatures above zero because we're talking about an active layer that's thawed in the summertime uh, that's saturated. And then below that saturated active layer, we have permafrost. So we've got uh, below zero temperatures uh, and we're specifying no liquid soil moisture. So, so frozen layer, so layer. And comparing that then with the discontinuous permafrost example where the soil profile is unfrozen and we end up having a little bit of soil moisture, but relatively speaking, you know, much drier conditions, nowhere near as saturated as we are over the, the continuous permafrost. And for the land cover type, we specify a continuous and uniform wooded tundra. And we also assume a silty loam, which is a common soil type in permafrost areas. Uh, the land cover and soil type does not vary throughout the simulations. Uh, the, the soil temperature and soil moisture conditions are specified initially, and then they, they start to evolve with the model, with the WARF model simulation. All right, so then this is sort of the, this is the, the model setup. Here are two uh, weather scenarios that we're comparing. And our, so our synoptic forcing, we have the active scenario showing the left-hand column. And so um, I'm gonna go crazy with colors here, trying to color code things to keep them a little bit more uh, easy to, to keep track of. And so the active scenario, uh, shows us our 72 hour period. So zero hours, 24 hours, 48 and 72. And so we have our domain shown right here in each of those four steps. And so we see the passage of a low pressure system. So we see this low pressure system tracking across our domains. That's what we consider an active scenario. We do have this, this low pressure system tracking across. We do have precipitation falling. So that's sort of gonna mess up our, our latent heating and our, our, our rainfall. Uh, first, just this quiescent setting on the right-hand side. We really have no, nothing sort of exciting happening weather-wise. We have, you know, generally high pressure over the area. We do have a little bit of a, a disturbance that moves across the southern portion of the domain, but it doesn't impact that domain four. And so that area that we're continually zooming in on with our warp simulations, which is sort of up here. And so in this smaller area, uh, that's not impacted by that passage across the, the lower portion of the domain. And we're, we're forcing our, as our historical uh, weather observations, we're using the GFS analysis. All right, so then what does that look like? Uh, how does our, uh, how do our conditions vary? So first looking at the synoptic scale. So this was that domain two. And so we've got our continuous permafrost. Here I'm showing the low level cloud fraction. Uh, I'm, I'm showing the cloud fraction in general. We're going to sort of ignore, ignore the upper level clouds because we're interested in what happens from land atmosphere interactions at the surface. And so we're going to consider the low level clouds primarily continuous permafrost on the left, discontinuous on the right, and then the active cases on the top, the quiescent cases, the second row here. And what we're seeing is uh, cloud fractions that are higher. Or so we're seeing an increased amount of low level clouds shown by the sort of darker blue and lighter blue colors in over continuous permafrost. So both in continuous permafrost relative to discontinuous. In discontinuous permafrost, we're pretty much seeing no low level clouds. And so um, we're, we're sort of seeing drier conditions over this discontinuous permafrost 
then we're seeing over continuous permafrost. So as we have continuous permafrost, where we might have a lot more surface moisture, uh, or sorry, yeah, surface moisture, but also that 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 permafrost keeping the moisture towards the surface, um, then that ends up creating wetter conditions where we have more evapotranspiration occurring, more or more evaporation in general, and that leads to a more saturated atmosphere and low level clouds. We can also look at the accumulated precipitation to see whether we see drying versus wetter conditions over discontinuous versus continuous permafrost. Uh, and so on the left-hand side, as you can see by the, the blue shaded areas and even some of the lighter blue and yellows and oranges, that over continuous permafrost relative to discontinuous, we definitely see a lot more accumulated precipitation. So this is the, the precipitation amount over that 72 hour period. The active case, you know, obviously with the active case, we're seeing a bit more moisture because we have that passage of that low pressure system and the rainfall pattern tracking across the domain. Uh, but regardless of whether it's active or quiescent, we're definitely seeing less moisture, less, less accumulated precipitation over discontinuous permafrost than we do over continuous. Taking this one step further to look at the actual atmospheric circulation, on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the passage of that low pressure system over, and then we're, we're looking at the passage over discontinuous versus continuous. And so we are seeing some minor differences there. And so over discontinuous permafrost, that low tracks a little bit farther south, but that low also ends up being a little bit weaker. So this inset here shows the, the central pressure of that low. Um, we can see that's a little bit deeper over discontinuous permafrost than it is over continuous. Looking at the, the mid tropospheric circulation in terms of wind speed, wind direction, uh, and also the, the, the general circulation, uh, we're seeing a, a, a stronger, a deeper mid tropospheric trough occurring over continuous permafrost than over discontinuous. And so again, we're definitely seeing some, some different circulation features for the same scenarios based on discontinuous versus continuous permafrost. Zooming in now on the local scale, so, so trying to figure out what's happening at that, at that tiny domain where we turn off all the parameterizations and we let uh, the, the planetary boundary layer evolve naturally on its own. So looking first at sensible heating, and I'll also show here what's happening with the precipitation to go along with that. Um, so I, I apologize for having a slightly messed up color scheme, and so we're not using the same color scheme anymore. Uh, the, the continuous permafrost is shown by the solid lines discontinuous by dotted lines and the active case is blue and the quiescent case is green. And so essentially what we're seeing with sensible heating over discontinuous permafrost is that uh, you can see here that we're seeing more sensible heating over discontinuous permafrost, which we might expect. That's, that's our drier scenario. So more of the surface energy will go towards sensible heating and not so much towards latent heating. But after about the, the first 24 hours, we have that system track across in the active case. We see precipitation increasing and so there, there, therefore, we then end up seeing some increases also, uh, or there's rather some, some decreases in the sensible heat fluxes because the latent heat fluxes are starting to ramp up a little bit. In, more generally, the latent heat fluxes uh, do tend to be higher over continuous permafrost initially. So we, we're seeing uh, that the solid lines are bigger than the, the dashed lines right here. So we're seeing more uh, of that surface energy going towards latent heating as we would expect. But then as the, as the, the system passes, uh, that low pressure system passes, even over discontinuous permafrost, we're seeing some increases in latent heating occurring there. Looking at the, at the low level of relative humidity over, and again, it's sort of focusing primarily on what's happening in the, the lower atmosphere. And so over continuous permafrost, we're seeing higher levels of relative humidity than we're seeing over continuous, discontinuous. And that's the case both in the active and in the quiescent case. And then finally, I think, well, I got one more figure after this, looking at the planetary, at the boundary layer heights. Uh, so when we're again, comparing what's happening over continuous versus discontinuous permafrost, uh, whenever, so we can, we can see here what the actual planetary boundary layer height and lifting condensation level is doing. But whenever we have the, the planetary boundary layer above the, the lifting condensation level, we're gonna have a likelihood of clouds forming. If the planetary layer, boundary layer does not extend beyond or above the lifting condensation level, we have no clouds. And so we're seeing, for example, in the active, the actively forced scenario here, um, that the, the dotted line is above the, the solid line. And so we're seeing that uh, for, for blue corresponding to continuous permafrost, we're definitely seeing cloud cover occurring over the continuous permafrost. Uh, 
uh, which we're not seeing so much of over, sorry, over the discontinuous permafrost shown in red. So for the discontinuous permafrost, we're seeing the, the solid line remain above the, the dotted line. So, so no clouds occurring. Uh, and so again, it's gonna, the discontinuous permafrost looks like it's gonna be a, a drier scenario uh, in terms of lower, uh, lower humidity, lower uh, atmospheric moisture, fewer low level clouds and so forth. And then finally looking at the actual low, the, the, the low level clouds, we can see over continuous permafrost, we see uh, much higher cloud cover than we see over discontinuous permafrost. And that's the case for the active scenario. And for the quiescent scenario, especially, we're seeing cloud cover occurring over uh, the continuous permafrost, but no clouds at all over discontinuous permafrost. So what does all that mean? And what do we conclude from all that? Uh, so summarizing this synoptic scale, a uh, part of the portion of the, the analysis uh, over continuous permafrost, we're, we're seeing weather conditions, basically. We're seeing increased level of clouds, a higher cloud base as well. Um, we're seeing more precipitation occurring. And so that's it's that weather scenario that we show with our initial study. We're also seeing some changes in the circulation over, over, synopt over, over the uh, continuous permafrost. At the local scale, the differences are that continuous permafrost, more latent heating, uh, more humidity, more cloud cover, discontinuous permafrost, we're seeing a, a lot more sensible heating, drier conditions, and therefore less humidity and fewer clouds. And so then with this, uh, with this model, uh, this WARF simulation, uh, we're, we're able to support our initial study, that, that uh, proof of concept that we did uh, with the, the statistical evaporative fraction analysis. We're seeing more moisture in continuous permafrost regions and drier conditions over discontinuous permafrost. And so we're, we're concluding that um, as permafrost will continue to change the distribution of frozen ground as we go from continuous uh, as we degrade the continuous permafrost to discontinuous and the discontinuous permafrost maybe start to disappear, that we, that we will see an initial wetting of the Arctic, an initial acceleration of the hydrologic cycle. But then ultimately the Arctic we think will dry out uh, in terms of those local feedbacks from, from permafrost. And so in our future work, uh, an important consideration is whether what we're finding is unique to sort of the, the tundra landscape that we see in the central Siberian uh, plateau. We do also have permafrost that occurs in boreal forest regions. And so for example, over North America, some of the opposite feedbacks or some of the opposite conditions have been observed. Others that have been looking at uh, boreal forest regions are actually seeing that as permafrost is degrading, that the, the atmosphere is, is becoming wetter and the rainfall patterns are increasing in response to permafrost degradation. So there seems to be an opposing feedback that occurs over the over boreal forest permafrost relative to what's happening over the tundra permafrost that we analyzed. And so far we've only looked at idealized conditions. So we're prescribing the land surface. We're assuming you know, the, the same sort of shrubby landscape everywhere, the same soil conditions everywhere. But in terms of getting realistic uh, future scenarios, we need to look at longer time scales than just those 72 hours that we looked at. And we also need to account for the substantial landscape heterogeneity that actually occurs in the Arctic. And so we do have lots of permafrost patches. We do have lots of wet areas embedded within dry areas. And so we don't, we don't, we definitely don't have that idealized scenario. So that then will complicate things more. So then in terms of acknowledgments, acknowledgments, this work was not done by just me. In fact, it was done by students. And so the first portion of the study uh, I did with, uh, with uh, Trent Ford, whom some of you might know. He used to be a PhD student here at AM. Uh, he then He's now the, the state climatologist at, uh, at Illinois, in Illinois. And so it, it, this is an independent project study that I did with Trent when he was a student here. And then the, the second part of the study was part of Dan Vasilio's dissertation. Uh, he was my PhD student who just graduated about a year or so ago uh, and is now doing a postdoc at Penn State. And so this uh, was work that was done mainly by the students, uh, but I was able to help them and, and work with them on that. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And if you have any questions that come up afterwards, it's just my name at temu.edu. So thank you. If there's questions in the chat, I can't actually see the chat. So if somebody can please let me know about that. I'll let Katie monitor any questions here and I'll watch the chat. Thanks. Just for the next few minutes and then the grad students will take. 
Hi, Ben. Hey, how are you doing? Thank Fine, you. Thanks. First off, Oliver, thanks so much. Great talk. I really enjoyed it. And in fact, I think you may have answered my question with what you said right at the end. But I had just read an article about an increase of wildfires in the boreal forest in the Arctic. And, uh, you know, that the warming, the, the premise that these authors were making is the uh, Arctic is warming. There's been some there's been some evidence of less rainfall. And so you're getting more of these big wildfires. And, uh, but that I guess would go along with what you said right at the end that in the boreal forest, there seems to be almost the opposite uh, response to the, the, the permafrost potentially melting. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And so um, I presented this work at one point and somebody was in the audience. Uh, there, there was somebody from Canada who was working on the boreal forest region there and he thought it was really interesting. Uh, and so one of the things that we want to do is repeat this exact same wharf study over a boreal forest domain to see uh, what happens there. And so you know, sort of keeping everything the same as it with our simulations, but just you know doing it over an Alaskan boreal forest area. Um, because yeah, there's been a lot of interesting studies actually. So we are seeing an increase in wildfire in wildfires. So as the Arctic is getting warmer, we're seeing more convective precipitation occurring. There's a lot more lightning that's occurring. And so CAPE is increasing in the Arctic. And so there's a whole lot of uh, interesting land atmosphere interactions that are probably gonna happen as the Arctic is getting warmer and initially wetter. Yeah, cool, thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks again for presenting today. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'll ask one quick, uh, if that's okay. I, 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 you might've actually said this, if you think there's a chance of runaway uh, positive feedback for the melting of the, or the uh, thawing of the permafrost and release of carbon. Did, did, you, did you reference that? I'm not sure. Well, yeah, and so when it comes to carbon, there definitely is this, this positive feedback uh, and so a lot of people are looking at how much, what's happening with the carbon aspect, um, but you know, so that's and so we're looking at the geophysical feedbacks, uh, and so yeah, so we are also hypothesizing that from these geophysical feedbacks uh, that what's, what's happening with the uh, the latent and sensible heating at the surface that we might also see some uh, some changes there. And in fact, another another study that uh, Dan Maselia did for one of his other dissertation topics, uh, he he looked at uh, using the the CESM model looking at the, a large ensemble to simulate what might happen with uh, the actual local uh, to see whether changes in the atmosphere can be attributed to large-scale circulation changes versus to to uh, versus to actually the the local uh, heating surface heating um, and so that's if we do see feedbacks occurring that as from us degrades uh, we end up more more uh, land atmosphere interactions, more uh, sensible heating occurring at the surface as well, uh, then that could also be a positive feedback that's occurring due to the geophysical, uh, feed, to the geophysical uh, changes that we're seeing. Sort of a rambling answer, but yeah. Thank you so much, Oliver, um, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to invite the faculty to exit the room and leave the grad students till the 45 mark. Before I leave, I am going to put the green um, address here in the chat for folks who can join us um, after um, the 45 mark. But thank you again, Oliver, for, for joining us today. And thank I'll you to the grad students. Let's see if I can turn off the screen sharing here. <laughs>